Why is the world in the mess that it's in right now? Sheldon Solomon is best known for co-developing terror management theory based on the theories of social scientist Ernest Becker concerning how humans deal with their own sense of mortality. He is professor of social psychology at Skidmore College and is the author or co-author of over a hundred articles and several books. Why is there bigotry? What is it that makes us hate, distrust, or live apart from our fellow human beings who may look or act differently from ourselves? Hi, I'm Sheldon Solomon. This is episode five of our conversation series. In this episode, we explore the psychological underpinnings of unconscious bigotry. What is at the heart of racial bigotry? The meaning of being human has changed yeah. over the last, you know, five, six hundred years. Racism or white supremacy, because it's not just racism, it's a specific historical event of yeah. white supremacy and domination, has changed what it means to be human in that it's an investment in the white person as a, a created entity, you know, there's no, no such thing. Uh, it didn't exist, you know, yes. 600 years ago. People weren't talking about, I'm, I'm white. I'm sure you're very familiar with the uh, implicit association yes. uh, tests uh, literature that shows that most Americans automatically prefer white faces over black faces. They automatically associate white people with good things, black people with bad things. Right. They automatically associate black people with guns or black people with drugs. So these things have now become implicit or unconscious, automatic in our society. And I think they build on top of death anxiety. Yes, let's not say racism mm -hmm. anymore. That's a generic term that obscures the historical fact. White supremacy mm -hmm. is both more accurate as well as more disturbing. More disturbing, right. Maybe white domination, uh, but it's really about human, you know, like who you feel you are yeah. and, and who you feel you are relative to other people. That's right. I wasn't here uh, mm -hmm. when we exterminated the Indians and I had no part of a culture that was built on the backs of slaves, but that in no way absolves us of, mm -hmm. of culpability in these matters or at the very least acknowledging the traumatic effects that those events have had uh, on the people that were adversely affected by them. Once you say, all right, the problem is white supremacy, and once you unearth, as you just mentioned, that these are historical constructions mm -hmm. that have nothing to do with either race or ability, well, then we're in very different terrain. The implications are ominous because it suggests things will have to change. Where the problem is community members who are undesirable. Right. Underneath that is the belief that all black people are subhuman and dangerous and violent. Right. Therefore, when you see a 12 year old on a playground with a toy gun, you don't even stop to ask a question, Shoot. you just kill them. Yeah. Um, Four seconds. Yeah. I think kind of this question about racism and whether people are good, good people aren't racist, or there's, you know, this kind of, if you try really hard and you're nice to everyone, then you're not racist. It's missing what racism truly is, which I think is, it's in our cultural DNA. Our, our society was created on racism. That's correct. Um, you can't live in the United States without acknowledging the fact that the United States is predicated on disenfranchisement of indigenous people, stealing their land, bringing Africans over as slaves. That's the fabric of our society. I think we're much, uh, more comfortable thinking of, of really um, overt acts of, of violence and name calling as being what racism is. But, you know, almost everybody knows what the word socialization means. Mm. And yet they don't want to apply socialization to the problem of racism. They don't want to recognize that when ideas like that are so deeply embedded in the culture, we grow up on them, we accept them uncritically because they are the ideas presented to us and we don't have the capacity to, to be critical. When you 
take the full weight of what that means. It means we're all racist because we've taken on those views. And it's embarrassing and shocking if we're honest with ourselves to see these attitudes spring to mind unexpectedly. Yeah. And most of us just repress that. But I, I think what has to happen is for us to have the honesty to recognize it in ourselves, that it's not the N-word, it's not an individual act or overt act. The dangerous part of it is how unconscious it is in all of us. If you grow up in a culture that has a racist history, you're going to pick up those kinds of ideas. The same with sexism, the same with all of those kinds of um, attitudes towards groups of people who are considered other. Mm -hmm. And the, the real powerful thing is to see it in yourself. And that's, I find that a very painful thing to do. But as long as it's unconscious, you can't control it. That's a good point. Once you acknowledge it, you can, it's one thing to say, it's not so hard after you've gotten used to it to, to realize that you're racist because of the culture you grew up in and that you didn't intend to choose it and you are trying to choose against it. But the idea that it doesn't exist except in these very dramatic and public displays of hatred, that's ludicrous. That's not the root of it. And there's also so much anxiety when people talk about race. And people say the word race, people say racism, and people get so anxious you can see bodies change. Um, and I think part of it is this denial of racism that exists. I think also there's this fantasy. Remember when Obama was elected, people were like post-racial America and how absurd that feels now, looking at Ferguson and Eric Garner and all these things that have happened. And honestly, they're not new. These things have just been happening and they're just brought to attention thanks to Twitter and Facebook. And I think that anxiety forces people to not want to look at themselves. And I think that anxiety also asks people um, to, to push towards more colorblindness. I don't want to feel this anxiety, therefore let's ignore racism, therefore the solution to this anxiety is to pretend it's not happening or to pretend that it's made up um, or say that I'm different. Um, it's not me, I'm not the bad guy. But I think at the heart of it is this sense of that people are others and they're undesirable. And so we want to remove them. And if you just remove the situation, then you don't have to confront what's really underneath. I don't think there's been a real acknowledgement publicly that we are living in a society that is inherently racist. Really, it's this us and them mentality that the people who belong here are people who have a certain skin tone and have certain economic background and have less recent immigration. That their great, great, great somebody came here at a time when the state was still being formed. And I think that really goes kind of thinking about, A, the history of immigration, the history of our country, and how racism is inherent in all of it. But I also think it goes back to this idea of us and them um, at the heart of it, that if you don't speak the same language as I do, you're different, and that your access and legitimacy in this country is very racialized. When we talk about immigration, we're not really talking about Irish immigrants. We're not talking about the Swedish people who overstay their visa. We're talking about a specific type of person, what they look like. And I don't think it's a coincidence they look like indigenous people often. If you think about people who are coming from Mexico, they might have more ethnically in common with the indigenous people of the United States and Southwest That's right. who are the tr true non-settlers. And when I think about immigration and that kind of immigration debate, it's another kind of othering. Donald Trump said that Mexicans are rapists and criminals. And it doubled his popularity. Really? Just, <laughs> it's yep. this incredible othering and not based in reality. When I think about internalized racism, I think how it expresses itself in people of color is internalized inferiority, and then white people internalize superiority. Absolutely. When it comes to gender and sexuality, I think what we're missing is kind of an understanding that whiteness is not the default. So like a, when you picture someone gay, it's not always a white person. Right. And when you picture someone who's trans, it's not always a white person. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of it. I don't want to say it's all of it. No, but I, I suspect you're right. And it's hard when we have such a segregated society. Like when I live in New York City, it's, it's such an intensely segregated town. Even though we're all on top of each other, the schools are horribly segregated. If I get on the train in the morning going the wrong way, I don't even have to know that I'm going the wrong way to know that the difference is by I, people, what they look like on the train. Yeah. We don't want to acknowledge that Thanksgiving is not Thanksgiving for six-year-olds because we still want to feel good about it when we cook corn in November. And we don't want to think about, well, if Thanksgiving's not Thanksgiving, then what happened to indigenous people? Oh, they're still here, they're not a myth. Oh, they have huge rates of trauma and PTSD in their community, a lot of sexual violence, police brutality. 
where's their land? You know, it's like this Pandora's box people don't want to open. And I think, frankly, if you keep following that chain, it's obvious that our entire state becomes illegitimate because it's based on war crimes, essentially. And then that unravels immigration. If we're looking at the United States as really an illegitimate state, if we're acknowledging what it was to create the Americas as we know them, this veritable orgy of bloodshed, slavery, genocide, and rape that created the state, and if we agree that these things are wrong, then it starts to question the legitimacy of the people here. And all of these things that we're kind of holding our state together um, rely on these fantasies, these historical fantasies. We're back to heroism. Back to heroism. <laughs> What are some of the psychological underpinnings of bigotry? When we look at our hero systems, one of the easiest ways to feel heroic um, is to see yourself in a superior position to other people. And from Becker's point of view, at least, there is definitely a, a very functional need for us to envision others as, as inferior. Mm -hmm. And we can do it along class or race lines, we can do it along sex lines, gender lines, all kinds of experiments have been done on this. That's something natural in us. Yeah, and it's very daunting. Um, so we have a natural tendency that, to divide the world into us and them. And uh, I don't think that's gonna go away. If you're part of the dominant culture, well, you want to think highly of yourself. And that's easy to do when other people generally treat you with respect, when other people perceive you as not quite human and therefore not worthy of admiration and respect. Well, that's tremendously difficult. We're going to have sycophants and swindlers. We're going to have people that are angry and bitter. And now we're going to have folks that just from being beaten down relentlessly, you have no choice but to adopt other people's conception of you. It's a consciousness where black people view the world through the eyes of whites and also through the eyes of their own culture and personal experience. And yes. I think Baldwin probably dramatized this more than anyone for me, and in saying that, reporting that he, that one day he's walking down the street and he walks past uh, some windows that mirror his image, and and he thought there's a Negro. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like in, in his own mind, he's, he he identifies yeah. himself as the other, yes. and then has to reown himself. You know, there's yeah. dif difference, and uh, I think that gulf of experience, you know, it, it's another huge gulf that when we see how uh, whites and blacks view politics, uh, you know, almost any situation, police shootings, the gap is huge. It is and huge. it's not as huge as this huge gap in personal perception and perceptions of others, which I think is even more large. Ultimately, it's based on these systems of self-esteem. You know, how do we feel yeah. good about ourselves? How do I feel... Um, that I'm higher than the other guy. But it does raise what I think is an unnerving question, and that is that, all right, human nature is such that we need to perceive ourselves as valuable people in a meaningful universe. And so far, historically, as far as we can tell, one of the dominant ways of doing this has always been to select some group of people as the designated inferiors. Well, but if that's not gonna change, are we not in trouble? There's the so-called other, and it takes less than five minutes in laboratory situations for uh, people to sort themselves that way. Virginia Woolf said it, we will despise someone for the shape of their nose or the color of their shirt. That's how much, you know, in Becker's language, we need the other as kind of the lightning rod to siphon off residual death anxiety. I just find that of all of these points that I find almost insurmountably discombobulating is that that claim that, that there's no belief system 
tall enough to stand on its own merits, that they all depend on having a designated, all-encompassing repository of evil. Can you imagine, you know, just from your view as a, a person who's actually been working in mental health for years, is it possible uh, to have self-esteem without a designated inferior? Or is this a, a, an unfortunate historical artifact that will outgrow someday? Yeah, that's an important question. I think it's a question of self-reflection and self-knowledge, like the information from the implicit association test. Most whites will take it, will find that they prefer whites. What can they do with that in terms of self-knowledge, in terms of self-development? Uh, actually, about 30% of the blacks who take it also, will also prefer that's whites. That's correct. Uh, what can they do with that? I think that's the challenge. Is there some magical, critical mass where people can develop and self-reflect and then and of course self-reflection comes through action i think most folks might be willing to admit that there are psychological explanations for a variety of phenomenon without being able to, to or willing to go to the next step and grant that that might have implications for what to do and they might be right. It may be easier to understand why things are happening than to do much about them. At the end of Escape from Evil, when he says, well, I don't even know if humankind is a viable form of life, well, that's a pretty dire place to end up. I'm not sure that I subscribe to that view entirely, but I'm pretty sure that if Becker's ideas are right, um, that any quaint notion of unequivocal happiness must be tossed uh, overboard, psychologically speaking. What terror management theory is about is about the impossible problem, and that being that we're gonna die, and that all these other things have impossibilities involved in, in, in coming up with ultimate solutions. You can teach people to change their orientation towards other people in the short term and, and present values or emphasize values. That, in a small scale, can be helpful, but ultimately, what that's gonna do is rub against somebody else's notion of morality. For example, the movement towards accepting same-sex couples. Big chunk of the country thinks that's a huge moral step forward. We can have our opinion one way or the other, but the problem is another big chunk of the country think that's a moral atrocity. Can anyone think of a moral issue that doesn't fit this pattern? That the ultimate good that we see, that I see or you see in something, somebody else is gonna see that as absolute anathema to their most core values. What are some possible solutions to bigotry? One thing we need is more people like that FBI agent, I wish I remembered his name, um, who was addressing police officers after a few of these yeah. shootings had occurred. And he said, we are all racist. You've got you've to quit fighting this argument. Do you know the culture you come from? Mm -hmm. That was amazing. I mean, that, that needs to be widely distributed. When people would make the argument we aren't racist, he said, just drop that. Mm -hmm. Just drop it. The starting point is we all share this. Taking a flag down is really powerful and very important but there needs to be more behind it. You can't just take a flag down and say like, I did it, I ended racism. What we really need to be doing is what you're saying, confronting the fact that it's within all of us um, and how it manifests in all of us is different. Like how living in a racist society manifests for somebody internally who's black is different from somebody who's white. But the only way we're going to supersede these problems is by facing them and talking about them. And I think some of it is about confronting it with protest and I think some of it is about education but it's really hard. We can agree on what has to happen, starting perhaps with historical truth um, in grade school. Yeah. Christopher Columbus didn't discover America. We're not exactly the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's depressing to see the new textbooks that have gone into that. effect in Texas. But that's what I mean. It's like, well, let's be a little bit more blunt. You know, our country was founded on genocide, built on the backs of slaves. And then, you know, and the fact is, we don't have slavery anymore, not because we're opposed to it, but because it's cheaper to rent the slaves rather than own them. 
A lot of people think that these topics are too big for children and young people to grapple with, that there isn't a developmentally appropriate way to talk about race and racism because it's too horrible. And I think that really, A, does a disservice to all young people, and B, young people know what racism is. Children experience racism and children perpetuate racism. Um, and all of these kind of violent pieces of our history need to be told and explained to them. The Pope is making the point, this interdependence of nature. Human beings have a special kind of responsibility yes. that other creatures may not have because of the nature of human capacities, mm -hmm. but that equalizing that we are all the same, that equalizing that we all are aspects of nature, each of which has a role and a significance. And I think getting back to only interdependence when we are forced to see ourselves in others. I think empathy is like a key element. If understanding that your black neighbor is a person and struggles and has happiness and joy and family and experience and you become a part of their life, then they're not gonna seem like less of an other. Yeah. And I think the fact that race is a social categorization that is just using arbitrary physical features such as skin color and hair texture to create an other when in reality we're genetically the same. It's really about getting to that empathy and getting back to the, the humanity that we all have. So familiarity is one strategy. I'm always impressed, I mention this often, the research that you did to discover when you um, are testing death salient people to see if they will show that animosity towards another. When you say, oh, yeah. think about this before you write, that is astonishing the impact that has. In other words, if you get people to think instead of feel, they have access to the sorts of awareness that, of, the, of the things that you're just saying. So familiarity and using your head yeah, using instead your of head. responding with a gut emotion or right. spontaneity. But again, it's a tough nut. Mm -hmm. you know, what you're asking for, Vita, and I don't disagree, you know, in Nietzsche's language is we have to reevaluate all values. We have to be willing to deconstruct our world and Coming back to Merlin's point, channeling Becker, you know, revise our view of the world to render it honest and, and uh, not a massive obfuscation of the facts. And you just put it better than I. We're all racists and we have to start thinking about that. And then as Merlin was saying, we have to start to think about the institutional structures in which all of these things are embedded. How do we regain um, the, the face of humanity so that the face of yeah. humanity reflects all of the faces that we have? That's a great point. The liberals are well-intentioned. Of course, redistribution of wealth is in order. Of course, education is a good idea but we're not gonna get anywhere until we recognize that people of color are victimized by the low expectations that others have of them by virtue of their appearance. If you find that you have these racial attitudes or you realize that you profit from white supremacy or this just part of your life, you can't escape it. I mean, you can't just say, I'm gonna give up white supremacy. Well, good luck, but as soon as you walk out in the street, right. you know, you're participating in it. But that challenge of what do you do with it means, what do you do in the world? Talking about the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, and, and the day-to-day -day reality of white supremacy that continues. And I think that rather than appealing to people's sense that this is wrong and there's some moral onus on them, is you point out, this is just ugly. Just looking at how ugly it is and how it's expressed in so many ugly ways racism or white supremacy created the conditions to justify itself so that when, exactly. it, when it said these people aren't human, it then created a set of conditions where, they, where the people living in them were not in this, any full sense of the word human. Right now, the Black Lives Matter movement is pointing out a simple reality that our systems of law enforcement and justice are destroying black people at a very rapid rate and it's men, women, and children. I think that the Black Lives Matter movement, the broader point they're making is that black people matter just generally. It's not just that we have to wait to get killed to show up on the screen, but we're participants in this culture. I like what you said earlier, which is doesn't much matter 
if you come from a religious point of view and, and speak in terms of sin, or if you do it from the secular slash scientific point of view, it doesn't matter. The priests talk about sin. Sin is not uh, being anxious or making mistakes. It's an unwillingness to acknowledge that you've done that and then an unwillingness to do something about it. And, and similarly, in, in psychotherapy, uh, it's not that uh, we're weak or ignorant. Uh, so much as being unwilling to do the psychological archaeology necessary to raise our difficulties to the level of awareness to the point where we can do something about them. And I think pointing that out and, and emphasizing it is edifying. They're not pointing out these things to make you feel bad. It's, no, that's is that right. Th that there's, there's a hope that something good can come out of the discourse, but it's unclear what, it, what, what it's going to be. That's right. Let's raise them to the level of consciousness and grapple with them, uh, hopefully as uh, mature people. Where is their hope? One area that we're making some progress in socially is begrudgingly but nevertheless is a broader acceptance of a variety of forms of gender and sexuality. I never would have thought that... The last decade. Yeah, what's happened in the last decade is astonishing that we're... And again, I don't want to overstate the case, but we're on the threshold of treating folks somewhat decently, regardless of how they describe themselves. How have we made progress in that domain where we're still haven't gotten past the inquisition with race and class? There is something really amazing that's currently happening when it comes to gender sexuality, kind of a creativity and a broadening beyond a gender binary, beyond even a sexuality binary, that you're either gay or you're straight. There's more fluidity and people's identities change and shift over time and even throughout their own life. Yeah, so I like how you just put it, because it, uh, I, I like the shift away from binary to continuum, because it's harder to be us versus them when you're on a, yeah. continuum and, and uh, the egghead in me is like oh wow if we can understand that maybe we can export it yeah. to other domains i think one one other factor that's occurred though goes back to familiarity being one of the ways we overcome our biases and that is that as gays and lesbians were coming out more and more often more and more people had family members or friends or community yeah. acquaintances, friendly acquaintances, you know what, that, and, that... and what happens? You know, all of a sudden, we get the statistics on the millennial generation, and they're not pro-gay rights. They're saying, why do you care? That's even better than, than I mean, that means you've skipped a step. Yeah. This is not your business. This is privacy. Why do you care? That familiarity normalized right. gays and lesbians and later, transgender and other, other gender variations. And they simply went all the way to, it's just varieties of human behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was huge. I mean, for years I've been saying, it's a generational thing, it'll be over in 20 years. And who yeah. knew, we didn't have to wait 20 years. It's had such a huge impact. I think I've had experience, and after I read back, I think I became a little bit more open to uh, other people's belief systems and less quick to just say, you know, your, your way is full of crap. So I think at the individual level, you can become more compassionate, more empathetic to others when you realize that they're just trying to get by and deal with their own fears in their way. And it may not be your way, but if it works for them, right. that's okay. At the societal level, I think it's a little bit trickier to create societies that are more yeah. able to help a wider range of people deal with their psychological fears is unclear. Sheldon has often talked about maturing as a species and, ex and figuring out a way to accept our mortality um, despite the kind of biological predisposition toward, toward the fear. Uh, and maybe there's some, some ways 
to do that. Could you guys speak to that? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, to some extent, I think that's been happening already. Over the course of human history, there's been a bit of maturing. And, you know, I don't know, this is just sort of a, a little, little speculation we bounce around sometimes, but you know, there's this, um, this fairly influential way of thinking about morality that suggests that there are these five core evolved foundations, and some of those involve protecting your own kind and taking care uh, to remain, remain clean and pure and sacred and respecting authority. And to some extent, as cultures have evolved, many cultures have shifted the emphasis away from taking care of your own kind. So there, there is this hope of moving cultural values in the direction, in a more humanistic direction. And to some extent, you could argue that these other moral intuitions about caring for people and helping them and not harming them and being fair have, you, you could make the case that they've become more emphasized over the years, over the, over the millennia. And so you could argue that over time, people are gradually figuring it out and these kind of ideas may gradually change the way we think about people. There's the possibility that worldviews will get better. And one of the things Becker talked about is the idea is, you know, can we create better worldviews, better life-sustaining illusions? And there's always the possibility that, that could happen. The idea that human beings are all of inherent value, that wasn't something that was really central to most cultures until fairly recently. So the, po the possibility of progress is always there. Equality among different ethnic groups and races, uh, most of us would agree that's a better worldview, one that, that embraces that. An idea that may sound naive, but happens to be true, and that's to acknowledge that people all over the world have a lot more in common than we are different. And uh, if we could only become a little less tribal and uh, embrace others with a little bit more uh, open arms and open minds, that would also be a good thing. Gratitude, humility, just savoring life, and uh, not needing every activity to be a means to something else. It's, and, um, and these are all noble ideas, and I think they're good ones, and I think we can strive to approximate them.